good evening. We will welcome you back tonight. I know you're all wanting to know the rest of the M's tonight, right? Do you remember what the M's from this morning? What this morning? Wasn't it an M? Didn't all your things we're preaching on have an M? Yes, they did. Yeah. Which one do you want? Well, give us the whole deal tonight. I'll give it to you later. <laughs> Well, we're glad you're here tonight. Take your hymnal 583, 583, and this is Hold the Fort, so you might want to keep your Bible handy. You never know what's going to happen on the chorus. 583, let's all stand together, everyone standing. you said you was going to help us. You remember when Jacob was going to go back after he had taken the birthright from his brother and uh, his brother wanted to kill him. He was so angry and he went away and he came back and he sent somebody to check it out to see how it was going to be. And he said, oh yeah, Esau, he's coming and he's got 300 men with him. And I tell you that Jacob got a hold of God then. Lord, you said it. And so you, when you wave the answer back to heaven, you can just remind the Lord. Now, you're not telling the Lord something he didn't know. But he wants to know that you know what he said. So good to see you tonight. God bless you. In this little minute, we're going to have a, a special by some ladies. And uh, then we'll have a special by a couple. And, and then we're going to have a musical instrument for the offertory. And uh, I hope it will be a good meeting tonight. And uh, if we came expecting one, and may the Lord do what we hope he will do for us. I maybe have a burden on your heart tonight just by way of an uplifted hand. All right, pray for those requests that were mentioned this morning. And uh, pray for this service. Pray for the Wednesday night service. So on Wednesday night, I'm going to tell you some things, what you, what you can expect or what you need to know about your next pastor. And uh, hopefully, it'll be a blessing and encouragement. Now, some folks have wondered what, what is happening next. Well, the way it works at Winkler Road Baptist Church in our Constitution, the deacons are the pulpit committee, and uh, as far as I know, they are on top of things, and uh, they will be explaining things and who will be up and how that works. Uh, the way it works here, it's not a popularity contest. You don't bring in X number of people and then pick your favorite. The way we do it here is you have the whoever's coming in, and I told you I was hoping it was Brother Gary that you just vote on that person. And uh, so that's the way that works. And so you just ask the Lord to help those men and uh, that all this would be done for his honor and glory. And that's what we're talking about, the uh, unto him be glory in the church. And you'll find out what those M's were. I mentioned we spoke on one and we mentioned the others. And tonight, Lord, when we'll, we'll take a stab at working on the M's. And... Uh, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thou art God. 
You're the only God. You're the true God. You're the living God. You're an amazing God, an awesome God, a powerful God, a passionate God, a providing God. In thee, Lord, we live and move and have our being. And without thee, we can do nothing. What would we be or where would we be without thee, O oh Lord? So would you manifest your presence tonight? Would you bless in all the music, bless in our giving, our praying, our fellowshipping, the preaching, the invitation, all that is to be done tonight. May it have God's touch on it. We pray for our nation. Lord, in two weeks from Tuesday, there will be a major election in this country. And I just pray you'd help us. And uh, Lord, we don't ask you to give us what we deserve. We ask you to give us mercy. And uh, may you just work in, in our nation. Help our president, the vice president, those who are in authority over us, even on a local level. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. While you're standing, it's offering time, and the offering tonight is an instrumental by the a piano, the organ, or maybe even two pianos. An organ, two pianos, three pianos, four pianos. Anybody else want to come play the piano? And then Brother Gary on the flute. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, anyway, God bless you as you give your offering. Now I'll tell you when to be seated. Well, it's wonderful to be a child of the king. Uh, we're in the in royal family, a heavenly royal family. If you're a first-time guest tonight, you've honored us. I don't recall seeing you back there with, with us tonight for the very first time. But if I missed you, if you're a first-time guest, would you stand and receive something from one of the ushers? Okay, then it's just us folks. We have a special for you, and uh, some ladies are going to come and sing for us. So young ladies, you all come ahead too. And it'll be good.
you mentioned this morning about the baby shower for Audrey, and I do want to just remember, uh, remind you, ladies, that she is flying in, uh, which means she's flying home, and she probably has one suitcase. So keep that in mind as you buy gifts or gift cards or whatever. If you have questions about that, you can talk to Sarah, and she can give you some guidance about that. But that, that baby shower is 6 o'clock Tuesday night in the Fellowship Hall. And so, ladies, hope you'll come. It'll be a chance to see Audrey again in fellowship with the family. And uh, that'll be, I know, a sweet time. And then, of course, next Sunday, starting at 1030, there'll be no Sunday school next week. We'll have one service from 1030 to 12. And uh, the first two-thirds of that service, I guess, uh, will be groups singing pastor's favorites. And it'll be a wonderful time. And um, I know you're going to be here. Let me just encourage you. I know it's homecoming. It's an unusual day with pastors stepping down from the pastorate. But it'll uh, be a great day to invite somebody to come because we're having food. And say, look, if you'll come to church, I'll take you to lunch. And you can walk across the fellowship hall and take them to lunch. And uh, it's going to be a special day, and hope you'll invite. You know, we always ought to be looking for reasons or ways to invite people to God's house. And so this be a good one. We're having homecoming. Will you come uh, with me this Sunday? And uh, have them come at 1030 or 1030 because there's some good music. And it'll be a great time of fellowship. Pastor will be preaching tomorrow uh, that morning. And then, of course, we'll have lunch at noon, and it'll be a good meal. And we're asking all the ladies to bring desserts. And if you could pre-cut them, that will help our ladies as they plate them, just to make things a little safer and so forth. And we've got a good plan, I believe. And our ladies will carry that out. And excited about that. And then, of course, the 2 o'clock service will be uh, our church saying thank you uh, to our pastor, Miss Judy, for really 34 years of their life. I don't know if you've thought about it that way, but... Uh, he and his wife and, and family have given this church really their life for 34 years. And uh, we'll be saying thank you to them for that. Um, there is a project that we're working on that you should know about from the emails. Just a reminder, if you haven't got that in today, uh, you can email me and we'll take care of that. And uh, that would be good too. Okay? Good. The choir. Have you ever thought about the value of a soul? How much is one soul worth? What do they do in heaven when a person gets saved? What do they do when the Steelers win? When do they win? Yeah. Who, who you know, <laughs> not that I'm for or pro Steelers, but think about it. Think about all the things we get excited about. What does heaven get excited about? People get saved. The value of one. If you're a Steelers fan, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Spirit has been working to soften up a heart. All he needs is a willing servant to simply do his part. Can
Take your hand once again, if you would, please. Number 180. Number 180, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. 180. Does anyone know where that is found in the Bible? You guys are sharp, aren't you? Psalm 89, one right there at the top. Very good. Very good. Let's remain seated as we sing. Choir, we're going to do it a couple times so you can stay up here in this first one. one more time the choir will come down as we sing and while we do I want you to think about how God has been merciful to you if I got what I deserved right now I would be in hell the wages of sin is death aren't you glad for the second part of that verse but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord wow you think about those things how God's been faithful to you been merciful to you as we sing through the whole thing one more time. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness. Thy faithfulness with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing. Of the mercies of the Lord. Thank you. In just a moment, we're going to take the Bible, turn back to the book of Ephesians, the third chapter where we were this morning. 
But before we look into scripture, we have a duet. Miss Angela and Mr. Stephen. I like this song. This would be one that I would request. But they're doing it now. Arms stretched out wide, barely hanging on to life, left to suffer on your own. You came for all mankind to bridge the great divide, but somehow ended up alone. Because of all the blood and tears you shed, I will never know that kind of loneliness. Your spirit never leaves me, even when I'm hurting. I don't have to bear that burden on my own. You carried all Shame when you made that rugged tree your righteous throne. Because of you, I'll never walk alone. You came here as a man, I know you understand what it's like to walk these roads. My problems don't compare to that crown you had to wear. Still you make them as your own. Because of all the blood and tears you shed, I will never know that kind of loneliness. Your spirit never leaves me, even when I'm hurting. I don't have to bear that burden on my own. You carried all the pain and buried all the shame when you made that righteous tree your righteous throne. Because of you, I'll never walk alone. You carried all the pain and buried all the shame when you made that rugged tree your righteous throne. Because of you, I'll never walk alone. Because of you, I'll never walk alone. For leave thee, nor forsake thee. Oh, that we would walk with the Lord. Ephesians chapter 3, while you're turning. A couple things I'd ask you to pray for. Those books... Uh, you're welcome to go over another building. There are some CDs over there, uh, some other things. Now, the little caveat is, because I have it over there, does not agree mean that I agree with everything that's in those books or is on those CDs. Uh, I've gotten those from lots of places and so forth. But even if you go to a Christian bookstore, they probably have a little thing printed out and stuck inside that because we sell this book, uh, they don't necessarily agree with everything, so, but you're welcome to go over and look. And then we have Landmark Baptist College supposed to come down and, and take a bunch of those tomorrow. On uh, Friday of this week, uh, I'm inviting a number of my preacher friends to uh, come to a special luncheon at Mission Barbecue. I want to take them to, uh, out to eat because uh, these have been my friends over these, these years. And uh, so I hope they can come and uh, just enjoy a little fellowship for you. Pray for that. Then next Sunday, I think we're going to have uh, a number of preachers. 
uh, in the service. Uh, and then we may have other preachers that come in the afternoon service, but we'll have a number of preachers in the service, and we'll have a number of missionaries that will be in the service. I think it has the potential to be a very uh, stirring, moving uh, service. And especially if we come praying and asking God to speak to all of our hearts, that uh, it would be that kind of a service. When we go to the house of God, nobody wants to go to the house of God when first you want him to be at home. If you go to God's house, you want him to be at home uh, in his house and welcome and honored and glorified there. And then uh, you want other folks to come as well. So if you were here this morning, we were in Ephesians chapter three and uh, we started reading a little earlier, but for time tonight, let's start at verse 19. Ephesians 3, verse 19. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And may it please the great God of heaven that formed all things to stamp his divine approval upon the reading, hearing, heeding, and preaching of his forever settled in heaven, word of God, and three quick facts about the Lord. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. Would you pray with me for me, please? Dear Father, have your way in every heart, speak to every heart, speak to my heart. And uh, may you do a work in all of our hearts and in all of our lives this evening, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And to him be glory in the church. We mentioned this morning that there are a number of nuances on the word glory. And we gave you some verses. And Moses said to the Lord, show me that glory. And the Lord was going to, David said the Lord was going to build a house that he wanted to be magnificent. And that was the word that he used. It has to do with beauty and uh, splendor and something that would be awesome. And I've told you a number of times I don't use the word awesome very often. Uh, you can certainly use that word when you refer to God or to his word. And then on a little more mundane level, if you ever talked about the Grand Canyon, you could throw the word awesome in on there too. And, uh, and when you think about the Grand Canyon, uh, it's not a part of the original creation. The Grand Canyon is the result of the flood. But even as floody as it is, it's still impressive. Uh, first time you ever see it, it'll take your, your breath away. And then uh, the... The devil took Jesus to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. He said, I'll give them to you if you'll just fall down and worship me. And the implication is, if you just do it one time, I'll give you those. But all he could have given him would be a kingdom full of unsaved, wicked, re unregenerated people. And by waiting for the kingdom that he's going to get, he's going to get a kingdom of people who have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, not everybody gives God glory. The Lord healed 10 lepers. Only one returned to give him glory. And uh, then there is the story in the Old Testament. This is just a little quick review from this morning that uh, when the ark was taken and the two sons of Eli were slain, Eli and fin I mean, uh, Phinehas and uh, Hophni, one of their wives was delivering a baby and she called that baby Ichabod, which means the glory has departed. And you never want, I would hate to hear, you would hate to hear that if ever the glory of the Lord departed from Winkler Road Baptist Church. You realize for around 50 years, this church has been on this location, trying to make a difference in people's lives in the city of Fort Myers. At one time, this was just almost like a little cow town. Now in our county, we have probably close to 800,000 people. The world has come to Florida, to Southwest Florida. If you drew a straight line across from Wherever Orlando is, across the state and south, there's millions of people here. And they come from, even in our own county, we have 100 plus nationalities in our public school. And uh, the world has come. And even if you do not go back to or go to one of those countries, if you were to win one of those people to the Lord and somebody went back as a missionary, they could say, you know, we met somebody from your country in our country. And we gave them the gospel, and you could even ask them, I'm going to go to your country. Uh, do you have a friend or a relative you would like for me to go talk to? What an open door that would be. But the world has come to us, and so you would not want the glory of the Lord to ever to depart from Winkler Road Baptist Church. Uh, if there's any glory at all, 
even in a glimmer of it, a spark, at least you have the potential to a fire, to a for a fire. And as I have told you before, that Charles Spurgeon said to his church friend, if you dare get the ear of God this week, mention my name. It's not like everybody was going to get the ear of God. Not everybody had the kind of prayer life that they probably wish, wish they would have when they stand before the Lord. But if you can get his attention, he said, mention my name. And I would say that too. And you pray that for Winkler Road Baptist Church. We want the glory of the Lord to be in Winkler Road Baptist Church. I hope that the Winkler Road Baptist Church goes to another level. I heard about a guy, even in our state of Florida, who said, when I die, I want this church to die with me. When I heard that, I said, who, what preacher could make that statement or would make that statement? Don't they understand who the church belongs to? Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Why would you want a church to die with you? It's not your church. I do not want Winkler Old Baptist Church to die, period. I would want the Winkler Old Baptist Church to go to a whole other level. Not the next level like people name churches like that, but just to keep on going for the Lord. Keep on winning people to Christ. Keep on trying to make a difference. And the Bible says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. doesn't mean they won't try, but uh, we're on the winning side. But thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I hope this church keeps up its Bible. We use the King James Bible here. I hope they keep the right kind of Bible through their, their future until the Lord comes. By the way, it may not be very long before the Lord comes. You may not have to hang on much longer. But hang on as long as you need to hang on. I hope we stay with the right Bible. I hope we have the right kind of standards where you honor and glorify the Lord with your living. And I hope we have the right kind of people that come to Winkler Road Baptist Church who have this church in their heart and want God to bless this church, want God to bless you, want God to bless your family. Uh, I have family in this church. I want God to bless my family in this church. I want God to bless this church. I want God to make a difference in all of our lives, that he might have glory, that there might be a praise, a doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below. We want the Spirit of God to do a work in Winkler Road Baptist Church. I'm, I hope I'm not the only one who feels that way. I don't think I am. And uh, I think we have good godly deacons. You, you pray for the deacons, that uh, they'll be doing the, uh, the next thing when constitution calls for with bringing the next guy up for uh, to be considered you pray that god will bless them and you pray that there would be a spirit of unity of one accordness uh, in winkler road baptist church this morning we were talking about unto him be glory in the church with regard to our message and i was mentioning that the pulpit in the bible is where the message goes forth you know if the pulpit if the pulpit is not for something it's probably not going to fly Somebody might have an idea out here, say, well, I wish we'd do this, I wish we'd do that. Uh, if, if the pulpit is not for that, it probably won't get off the ground. And uh, you, somebody has to be in charge, and you want somebody to have the mind of the Lord, and that's why you need to pray. And we'll, we'll talk about that on Wednesday night, and uh, that the Lord will hopefully give some direction to the church for that. And uh, not because it's, I'm saying that's the direction of the church, but we have a Bible, and that gives us a direction for the church. But uh, the you know, message is so important. Uh, we want God to be honored and glorified. We want Jesus to be preached. We want the Spirit of the Lord to empower uh, what takes place here. We want the Bible to be preached. Isn't it interesting this morning I quoted that poem, and uh, the young ladies sang about that tonight? Oh. There's, just, <clears throat> there's just something about the Bible. Now, this morning we ended up, I was telling you a story about a guy by the name of Gene Neal. Gene Neal was the first guy that I led to the Lord in Lexington, Kentucky, a number of years ago. He was the last guy, about 15 years later, he was the last guy that I baptized. Now, let me tell you why it happened that way. Why he was the first guy that got saved, and he was the last guy that got baptized. They were sort of a connection. Gene Neal was in a boating accident, and he about drowned. Well, when you about drowned, have you ever heard the story that when you're about to die, that your life flashes through your brain. Now, how we know that, I don't know. But maybe it's people who thought they were going to die and they thought their life just flashed through their heads and they began to take serious about things. Well, he, he probably thought he was going to die. 
So he was fairly easy to win to the Lord. Sometimes you catch people at the right moment, and uh, it's a little easier picking than at other times. So why wouldn't he get baptized? He was a soldier. He thought he was going to drown. He was not a friend of water. He didn't want to get in there and have some preacher put him under there. Is he going to bring me back up? Uh, you know, I've been doing this for a number of years. I've never lost anybody in the Baptist church, and um, which is a blessing. And I really don't know of anybody else who has lost anybody in the Baptist church as well. But uh, he was afraid of water. So it was the last. I said, Jim, Gene, isn't it about time you get baptized? Because he knew I would be leaving in the next few days, and he said, yes, I can tell you. So his uh, his his desire to be obedient to the Lord in the matter of getting baptized overcame his fear of water. You know, the Bible says perfect love casteth out fear. If you love somebody or the Lord with the perfect kind of love, you will talk to some people that maybe you've never talked to. You'd be so timid or intimidated or thinking, man, these people beat me up. But, uh, no, I love God and I love them and I love the souls of people I'm going to talk to when I get up to the Lord. It casts out fear. Now, we want the Lord to have glory in the message, but also we want him to have glory in the mission. What is our mission? Our mission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. One of my favorite themes that we did for a missions conference here, and I mentioned to you the other day that Brother Gary and I chatted about probably the best time to have a missions conference with COVID going on would be next year around February or March or so forth. And uh, we'll give time for snowbirds to get in on that as well. But uh, the mission, uh, the mission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. My favorite one, one of my favorites, and probably all of them are my favorite, is the one that we did called Every Creature. We had the little lapel pin made up, Every Creature. And if somebody would say, that, well, what's that about? We, we have an opportunity to say that God wants us to give the gospel to every creature. And so when you go, you witness to whoever, you can never talk to the wrong person. A, everybody either needs the Lord, or B, everybody needs the next step in their Christian life. If they've been saved and haven't been baptized, or haven't been a member of a church, or haven't gotten involved in ministry, haven't been growing in the Lord, there's always something that you could do in your Christian life to take you on to the next level. You know, in the Bible, uh, the Scripture teaches us that only saved people get saved, or get baptized, and uh, only saved people get baptized, but all the saved people got baptized. Now, with the exception of the thief on the cross, and uh, depending on your theology, whether you thought the church started in Acts 2, or which that's what I think, uh, I think it was conceived uh, back when Jesus set up on this rock, I will build my church, but it was born in <clears throat> Acts chapter 2. Uh, the thief on the cross, if what I'm saying is correct, then he wasn't becoming a member of the church, but he didn't get baptized, that's the point, but everybody else did. On the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 people got saved, they got baptized. And the Bible says they did it the same day. And uh, usually there was not a long time. Uh, I'm ashamed to say I didn't know that years ago when I first got saved. My thought was about baptism is uh, you get saved and you get baptized. But I thought, you know, if you're going to get baptized, you mean it. And I didn't want to be hypocritical about it. And I was looking at, well, I'm not going to get baptized unless I'm just serious about this. Well, I wasn't serious about it. And uh, when I learned some things, so it was a little time after I got saved. I got baptized in the Albemarle Sound, part of the Atlantic Ocean. I, I got baptized in a fairly big Baptist school. And uh, it was outdoors, but uh, I was thinking, well, now I mean business. You know, in some countries, when missionaries go give the gospel to somebody, they don't even count them as a convert unless they're willing to get baptized. You know, you, you could pray and ask the Lord to save you in private. For the most part, people get baptized in public. It's a public testimony. And uh, so if they would get baptized, well, they mean it because people are watching them. And uh, you're drawing a line in the sand, as it were, that, uh, that you mean business for the Lord. You know, the Apostle Paul went about the longest of those guys in the book of Acts who got saved before he got baptized. Do you remember how long he went before he got baptized? Three days. Remember he was blind, struck blind on the road to Damascus? And uh, had people led him by the hand, took him into Damascus, and God came to a man and said, I want you to go down. And uh, he went down to talk, to, and he called him Brother Saul. 
And uh, then he got baptized. And uh, when he got saved and baptized, he was one fire brand for the Lord. And so uh, our mission is to get them saved and get them baptized. So I was thinking about mission. I said, well, let me, while I'm talking about mission, why don't I just broaden that out a little bit? And one of the things that Winkler Little Baptist Church has been is a mission-minded church. We want to win them to Christ, and we want to get them baptized, and we want them to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ so that they could go get somebody saved and baptized and teach them so they could go get somebody saved and get baptized and teach them. And that's how it works. And then when people go out from local churches and you go to countries like Albania or you go to countries like Zimbabwe or all these other countries somewhere between A to Z, uh, I hope we grow back to church. We'll always be a mission-minded church. Now, we have an unusual little situation. We have a lot of missionaries. And sometimes it's very difficult to keep up with all that. It's hard to read all the missionary letters. We have people who do things. Miss Treva keeps a good thing for us on missions and keeps the curio cabinet up and so forth. And, and then we have the, the ones here. And uh, we even have some missionaries that we support that are not even on, on these bulletins, that we, the posters that we have up. But my point is, I hope that Winkler Road Baptist Church will be always be mission-minded. Now, there are a number of things you could do. You could add missionaries or some of these people we support for uh, $30. Those are nationals, and we were told you support them for that amount in nationals. Some we support for $60. Some we support for $100. We have supported some for $500, and uh, depending on whether they were members of our church, came through the ministry here. And uh, so maybe it's time in the, in the near future that you uh, increase their support level sometimes. And uh, But you'll have wisdom about that, and you'll know what to do at that time. My point is, may we always be a mission-minded church. And I, I think most of you would agree with that. Now, not everybody agrees with that. Some people say, why should we send... Why should we send money to those other places? Well, they need the gospel. Aren't you glad that somebody brought the gospel to you? What if you've never heard the gospel? You say, well, I'm in America. There were churches down the street, but they, they live in countries where there are not churches down the street. By the way, today, and I suspect uh, in Bolivia, in Chile, those two countries in particular today have made elections in their country, whether they're going to change the constitution of the country of, of Bolivia and whether they're going to change the constitution of Chile, and meaning if they change it, it'll probably go socialist communist, which will make it even more difficult for our missionaries in Bolivia and Chile. It may be true in other places as well, but they need the gospel. The gospel makes a difference because the gospel works. So, May the Lord get glory in our mission. May he get glory in our mission outreach. And again, the idea is that you win people to the Lord, and you get them baptized, and then you teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, what I'm saying to you about him being having glory in the church, I said if you come in, the thing that's the focal point of Winkler Road Baptist Church, most Baptist churches, is the pulpit area. And then right behind most pulpit areas, if they have an indoor baptistry, it's right behind, so we're on a straight line. And then, usually, most Baptist churches have a communion table in front of the pulpit area. So we're still on, on a straight line. Now, the communion table is, now, people disagree on communion. Uh, some people do it once a year, some maybe twice a year, some once a quarter, once a month, once a week. Uh, some people do it. Every service, some people do it in the morning service. We do it at the night service. And uh, it's not called the Lord's breakfast or the Lord's lunch. It's called the Lord's supper. And uh, we, we observe this because, and some churches, they use fermented wine. Did you ever wonder why a lot of priests become alcoholics? You heard that before. You see, in their organization, the priest is the guy who drinks the wine. And uh, the people eat the bread. And uh, since they believe that once they do whatever they do, that this, th this wine becomes the actual body or the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it doesn't, but in their mind, this 
is wine becomes the blood of Jesus. Now, believe me, if they believe that, they're not, they're not going to take the blood of Jesus and throw it out. So what do they do? They drink it. And you've got this big goblet of wine up there, and he's going to drink it and not going to throw it out. And you can see where there would be a possibility of getting hooked. And a number of them have. And that's not, that's just not that being mean spirit. Man. That's just the fact. They would tell you that they have that problem. And uh, we use grape juice. We use what would be known as the fruit of the vine. It's the pure faith that Isaiah talks about. And so we do this uh, so that we could take three looks. We look back and we remember Calvary. We look in, because we don't want to do this unworthily, you do this so that you can take care of your sins, you can confess your sins by looking in, and then we look forward, how long do we do this? We do this until he comes. So when we observe the Lord's table, you take three looks, you look back, you look in, you look up. And uh, so we want the Lord to have glory. You want to be able to have the doxology over, over the meal. Then you want the Lord to have glory in your music. Now, uh, in my mind, this is sort of leading up to something. You're coming in, and you have the, the message, you have the mission, you have the meal. Now you're going to spread out. And uh, over on this side, we have a couple pianos. Over on this side, we have an organ. And... Uh, let me say at this stage, for 30-some years, Miss Ruth has been playing the organ in the Middle Road Baptist Church and does an excellent job, faithful, always been on the organ. Over here, we have uh, Una that plays, and Angela that plays, Linda now that plays, and uh, we've had people that play, and we've had people that come in, and uh, these are people that are faithful in giving us music. And uh, what we've done here at Winkler Road Baptist Church, this is not a hill that I want to die on. I don't know if I've seen the hill that I want to die on. But that was a, a military say, saying that, uh, uh, men, we're going to take this hill, going to defend this hill. Is that a hill you want to die on? And uh, uh, we've just taken the position at Winkler Road Baptist Church Right, wrong, or indifference, this is the, what we've done here, is that we do not use canned music. And uh, since we have people that can play instruments and we have nice instruments, then why not use those instruments? Now, I've had people come in and they have said, now, the, this, I know this is canned music, but it's just piano. And, um, and it's very good. And I said, you know, I understand what you're saying, and I know what you're saying, but let me tell you how it works. If we allow you to do your canned music, and three months from now, one of our families comes and says, you know, I, I, got a, I got a granddaughter or I got a niece or a nephew. They're very good singers, and uh, they have canned music. And you say, or I would say, no, we don't use that. Would you let them do it? You see where that's going? It's easier not to start something than it is to start it and stop it. Now, I don't know if you remember the song that came out years ago by, uh, it's called You Light Up My Life. How many of you remember that song? Now, contrary to what you're thinking, if you think that's a good Christian song, it's not about the Lord lighting up my life. It has a whole other connotation. Well, in Lexington, we had uh, a family that said, you know, my uh, whatever is going to be there. Can they sing? And uh, so we, we let this gal sing. And uh, one time, a, a guy got up and said, you know, I had two songs, and I didn't know which one to sing, so I'm just going to sing them both. But this gal, and this might have been that time, the second one that she sang was, You Light Up My Life. Now, I'm sitting over here, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. You don't understand what can really rob us spirit of the pastor I'm thinking what am I going to do about this A I could do nothing B I could stand up and embarrass this young lady 
and maybe throw in a C, embarrass whoever they're friends with. So uh, I decided I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to sit. Now, what's amazing about that is it hadn't been like three weeks before I was talking about that very song, Not Being a Christian Song. You light up my life, what it was really about. In that particular instant, one of the best things I could have done was accept it. People came up to me, Pastor, now I know why you're always interested in what we're singing. You know, somebody wants to sing a song, I said, well, what is it? And uh, because people, if they've not thought about those kinds of things, and uh, so they say, no, 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 I understand. Uh, so in that case, it helped. You know, God has given us music to glorify it. Whether you eat therefore or drink, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. But it's amazing how with singing, you can sing to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Uh, with your music, you can provide expression. Uh, it's in Mary, they sing psalms. Uh, it is amazing what singing does to us. You know, when God lifts us up out of the miry clay and puts our feet on the side of rock and establishes our goings, puts a new song in our mouth, even praise to our God, and many shall see it in fear and turn to the Lord. But music has a way of expressing and teaching, and you want the, uh, you want your music to be the right kind of music. Now, in, in churches, with all the crowd we got here tonight, if I were to ask you how many of you like this kind of music, yeah, like that kind of music, yeah, like that kind of music, yeah. And uh, so you cannot, you cannot please everybody. But in a church context, you want something to at least be pleasing to the Lord. And you don't want, it's amazing, <clears throat> you know, it's called today Christian rock. And, uh, you know, some would say that's a oxymoron. And um, if it's Christian, it wouldn't be a rock. If it's rock, it wouldn't be Christian. Uh, but nonetheless, it used to be that parents would say, I can't believe my kids are on rock music. And if you didn't think that they were hooked on it, try to take it away from them. And now <clears throat> it's granny and grandpa who are in churches singing rock music. Uh, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to keep your music somewhat pleasing to the Lord. And you want to keep it pleasing to the Lord. And, uh, you know, you can have uh, different kinds of music in your church service that uh, you, you don't want one that makes you think you're in a funeral. And uh, there is funeral music. And uh, you can't have the one that's like camp meeting every time you go. Uh, but you want music that is the right kind of music. You want music that would give honor and glory to the Lord. Does, does everybody understand what I'm talking about? You know, you want music that's going to glorify the Lord. And music has such a powerful effect on us. When Mr. and I were in, in Greenville, uh, Brother Wayne Wilson and Helen, super people. He pastored up in Oyuko and um, he had uh, retired and he was there, and so Judy and I went over and spent a couple hours with he and Helen, and they was telling us about this lady who basically uh, was schizophrenic, and uh, but she would come to church, and she was interested in the things of God, and uh, so I just thought about it. He was telling, she and he and Helen was telling us about it, and I thought about it, and I called him. I said, Brother Wayne, why don't you try something? Why don't you pick this lady up, and you take her to church? Why don't you get a CD of harp music? You know, David was the sweet psalmist of Israel. And he was cunning in playing the harp. I said, why don't you get you a good harp CD? And when this lady gets in the car, why don't you just play this on the way to church? And maybe just watch her reaction. Now, based on 1 Samuel chapter 16... There was an evil spirit that would come on Saul. And uh, when that evil spirit, on, he might pick up a spear and throw it at King David, or it would, to be King David. Throw it. And uh, he was just, he'd be like a madman. Well, David went over there and he took his harp and he 
when he was praying. The Bible says that Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit was gone from him. When he was refreshed, it affected him physically. Have you noticed that music can affect you physically? They say there are a number of people who could have all their dental work done without any shots or Novocaine by music. I don't think I would be one of them. We have a family in the church that the lady was having Parkinson's. And uh, she was a great piano player, Parkinson, and her, it affected her playing. And so she went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you know, I think I can help you. So he brought her in, and he said, I'm going to have to operate on your brain, but I, couldn't, I cannot put you to sleep. You have to be awake. And the reason she had to be awake is while he was probing around on these nerves, he would do one side at a time. She'd have this hand up, and it would be shaken. And he was trying to feel for the nerve, and when he got to the right nerve, the hand would stop. He knew he had the right one, so he would do what he was going to do, and then later he did the other side. And it gave her great relief. But it's interesting that the doctor said to her, Mrs. Erdman said, you, you can bring any music that you want to bring in and play it while you're awake, while I'm operating on you. So she took in How Great Thou Art. And the doctor is operating on her, and he's singing, How Great Thou Art. Now, if you're going to have a guy cutting on your brain, and, uh, uh, you know, for a guy like me, just a little snippet could, could be disastrous, <laughs> maybe a whole bunch of us. And uh, one guy, he, he told her, the guy before her brought in heavy metal music. Can you imagine, pow, 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 and the guy's operating on your brain listening to that? I don't think that would make, be very refreshing, nor would it be well. Refreshing is physically well has to do with emotion. Now, music, it's okay to be emotional. God made us that way. And then the evil spirit left him. So it affected him physically, and mentally, and spiritually. Music can do that to us. So you want to have the right kind of music. You want to have the kind of music that God is glorified. I'm not talking about dead music. Uh, you know, we've had singing here tonight that's not been dead. I didn't hear anybody snoring while it's going on, so it didn't put you to sleep. You say, well, it didn't, it didn't go on long enough. <laughs> I understand. But the point is that music has such a, it's a powerful medium. You know, here's a guy, uh, if you saw this uh, in, a, in a film, here's a guy walking in the forest. Sounds innocent enough, doesn't it? Just a little walk, a little stroll through the woods. Do you realize what you can do in changing the music of this guy? Just You can make this guy seem like he's happy just with music. You could make this guy seem like he's scared half to death. You could, you could do any kind of emotions just with music. And the guy just taken away. Mama was talking to her college kid. And she heard this classical music in the background. And she said, son, I am so glad to know that your choice of music has increased since you've been in college and you're listening to classical music. He said, oh, mom, I'm, I'm watching cartoons. Did you know that most cartoons had classical music? Now, today, they, they've changed that somewhat. But in the old ones, you know, they'd have uh, stuff. And she thought he was into classical music. He was into cartoons. The point is that do we want to have glory in our music? Yes. So uh, now so far, we've got this straight line. We've got the message and the mission in the middle, and now we bronze out. Do, do you see like maybe a little cross developing here? And uh, then we want the Lord to have glory in our money. Now, before we started with these white pedestals over here and put the offering trays, we used to leave the offering trays up here. Now, there was a time when our, our ushers would come in carrying them, but the, the, it used to be up on the table. 
and that would be the off place. Uh, do we want the Lord to have glory in our money? What do you think, yes or no? Uh, you know, the Bible teaches a tithe. A tithe, a tithe, mathematically, mathematically is a tenth. That's what a tithe means. Okay. Scripturally, it's our money. Uh, if you look at it as an investment, we are to lay up treasure in heaven and uh, not on the earth. Here, moth and rust and corruption takes care of, but there, it does not. And uh, spiritually, it's a blessing. Give, and it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. Uh, God says, if you don't tithe, you're cursed with a curse. Imagine that. Cursed with a curse. Uh, you've heard me say, some people, if there's a rogues gallery in heaven, it would have a bunch of pictures of some of us up there that would say thief. Will a man rob God? What do you think? Really? I didn't say will you, but will a man rob God? Well, the answer was yes, because God said, you've robbed me. And they said, wherein have we robbed thee? He said, in tithes and offerings. Bring you all the tithe in the storehouse and see if I won't open the windows of heaven for you. And a blessing that you will not receive it. You wouldn't be able to handle it. In England, they did in one of the papers over there a little contest on somebody gave what they would think would be the best definition of what money is. You know what one? This is what one. Money is a universal passport to every place except heaven and a universal provider for everything except happiness. Now money is, it's an extension of you. When you get up and go to work, they pay you a wage. And your wage is what you have made because you have invested your time and effort and labor into, into that. So uh, we ought to want God to have glory in our money. There's an interesting verse in the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. And he's talking about money, the wise man. He said in that chapter, there is such a thing as riches that is kept to a man's hurt. Here's a guy, he's got lots of money, and he has four or five children. So he's going to leave them something. And, uh, and his kids get out of sorts with one another. And this one got some money plus that or whatever. And uh, pretty soon, they're not even speaking to each other. Miss Taylor, that was my third grade school teacher, used to come to church here. had the privilege of leading her to the Lord and her husband to the Lord. Marguerite Gillespie, we met them on a sat in the garage selling kind of thing. They came, and her daughter was married to a lawyer who was a will lawyer. And the story that he would tell of people that would be very civil until the parent died. And then it's like, why are you acting this way? Don't you remember that night at the table when you wouldn't let me have seconds and I wanted it and you took it? And all these crazy kind of things that happen in their life all of a sudden pops out when the will is read. You know, if you don't expect anything, you don't get disappointed. May I just tell you a little quick story? My dad was a hunter. My dad had five guns and uh, he had four kids. So when he died, and I'm just talking about the guns right now, he told my mother, said, you, you kids, you can have these guns. Well, when I would go with my dad squirrel hunting, and I didn't get to shoot the gun, I just got to help him hold the squirrel when he skinned it. And, uh, but he had this 17 automatic 22 rifle. I always loved that gun. And uh, so that's the only gun that I wanted. Now, I, my daughter, sister is the oldest. I'm next, and I have... Larry, you met, and I have Jackie. And uh, so I said, Sue, you choose first. And there were some shotguns, and there was that rifle that I was telling you about, double barrel shotgun and so forth. So my sister took something. Now I'm next, and uh, the 22 rifle is still there. 
I said, Larry, why don't you choose? And he took a shot. I said, Jackie, you choose. And uh, no, he took the shotgun. And what was left was the double barrel shotgun and that 22 rifle. And later it said, well, Donald Wayne, you take them both. Not only did I get the one I wanted by going last, I got the other one too. I wish my son David is the recipient of that. Probably both of them right now at this time. And uh, now I got another daughter who's here and said, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, um, a congressman, this is what amazes, this is a congressman who did this. He took his son into McDonald's. And he's going to have a little father, son bonding time. That's, that's the expression. He's going to bond together. And so the boy was wanting some uh, french fries. So his dad bought him a large order of french fries. They went over to sit down, and they're having a little bond time. And, and dad got to smell those french fries, and he said, hmm, I'd like to have french fries. So he reaches over to grab the french fry, and his son said, dad, those are mine. could go buy him 20, 30 large orders of french fries and bury him in them. And he doesn't understand that I don't need his french fries at all. I have enough money. I can go buy all the french fries I want and give them to eBay. You know, what a great lesson for us to learn. God gives us our french fries or whatever. If he wanted to, he'd take it all away from us. Or he could give us a whole lot more. He doesn't need any of it. You know, God said, if I were hungry, I, don't, I wouldn't tell you. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. And he owns whatever's in the hills, too. He doesn't need anything. But we need to learn not to be stingy. We need to learn how to be generous, to be obedient. So, you ought to give him glory in our money. Then we ought to give him glory in our multitude. When I was thinking about church in the book of Ephesians, I read the whole book again today, and I was just looking, and I pulled out a concordance too, and I looked at how many times the word church is mentioned in Ephesians. But I had already marked, or meant to mark, the ones that I'm going to point out to you right now. By the way, which Bible, which book in the Bible do you think mentions the church four times in any of them? Take a stab at it. Oh, what did somebody say? Acts, Acts does. And uh, probably second would be 1 Corinthians. Now, that's just the word church, not church as church. But in Ephesians, would you look in Ephesians chapter 5? Verse 22, why submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, he's talking about a man and his wife in connection with the church and the church the head of the church is Jesus. There's verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now you move over to husbands. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. If you were here a few weeks ago when Brother Bruce Humbert preached on the glorious church, it was a great message on the glorious church. And the Lord is going to present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. And in 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. I'm talking about he ought to have glory in our multitudes, you could say in our marriages. It's like men, your wife's the church and you're it. You're the head. You're Christ. But the husband loves the wife just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. 
that he might have a glory in the church. Let me tell you what the secret is. Many people have this church, other than obviously the Lord knows how many people. You people just stay right where you are. And the man of God is preaching like the prophet was. And we're observing and things like that. But the sky is the limit. Unless everything falls apart because it's going to get worse and worse, as the Bible says, prior to the coming of the Lord. But it's the people. One of the strong suits of our people, other than the fact that I think you believe right, is that you're friendly. You're very friendly. Do you realize what a ministry you could have in this church just by being friendly? Somebody walks in the door. They look like they're new. Go introduce yourself. Tell them who you are. Introduce them to somebody else. It only takes two or three or four people to go shake somebody's hand before those people leave that church thinking, that's the friendliest church I've ever been in. Have you ever been in a church where nobody shook your hand? Not even the preacher. I was in a church once, Judy and I, and uh, I observed the pastor when he came in, and he never... He never came, shook her hand. And then later I learned what he was waiting on was for somebody to go find out our name and tell him so he could walk up and say, hi, Don Strange and Judy Strange. So I, I, I felt a little bit about him, better about him then. Uh, you wouldn't want nobody to, you wouldn't want nobody to ignore you. So you're the key. You're the key to Metro Baptist Church. You know, as far as I know, God has given us some people. Uh, you know, if you teach, if, if you're always fighting and you teach people to fight, someday they'll fight you. You want to make sure that you teach them to fall in love with the Lord. And if they fall in love with the Lord, would you like to pastor a, a group of people who fall in love with the Lord? Be good, wouldn't you? You're one of the secrets that you would be filled with the Spirit. You would know your Bible. You're trying to be the right kind of Christian so that we could say unto him be glory in the church. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and stand to your feet?